The scripture this morning comes from Psalm 51, verses 1 to 17. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my inequity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in inequity, and in my sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean." Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my inequities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. A woman by the name of uh, Corey Ten Boom wrote her famous biography called The Hiding Place. The book was written as a memoir of her experience as an adult Christian living in Nazi-occupied Germany, actually Holland, at the height of World War II. She lived with her aged father and her older sister, Betsy. And when the Nazis took control of their town as Christians, she and her family did whatever they could to aid their Jewish neighbors. They hid them when they could, And when it was possible, they helped them escape into safe houses in the country. But in February of 1944, they were caught and arrested by the Gestapo. Their father, who was sick already, he died very shortly after. And Corey and her sister were, were, uh, they were first sent to a concentration camp called Voot. And they were later taken to a a, a women's extermination camp called Ravensbrook. In Ravensbrook, um, she she recalls the horrible living conditions and the extreme cruelty by the Nazi soldiers. She tells how the women in the camp were often forced to remove their clothing for inspection and tells about one soldier in particular who took great delight in teasing and humiliating the women, especially her older sister, Betsy. And this angered Corey. It disgusted her to the depths of her soul, watching her older sister being abused. But Betsy, being a woman of great faith, just took everything in stride and reminded Corey that even Christ was naked too when they hung him on the cross. On one occasion, while the women were working, the same soldier who the women called the snake again started making fun of Betsy for being old and weak and for not being able to carry enough dirt in her shovel. But this time, instead of just playing the part of the victim or laughing it off, you know, Betsy laughed at him and agreed that she couldn't carry very much in her her shovel because she was old and weak, which caused all the other women to laugh as well. Well, this was not the effect that the soldier had intended. 
Uh, so he jumped off the wall and he screamed in Betsy's face and he struck her to the ground. And Corey again talks about the rage that she felt and the hatred she felt towards this evil man who treated her beloved sister this way. Shortly after this attack, Betsy grew sick and eventually died in Ravensbrook from the abuse and, and from the harsh um, conditions in the camp. But in 1947, a few years after their liberation, after the Nazis had lost the war, Corrie Ten Boom went on a preaching campaign throughout Europe, even into Germany, hoping to bring Christ's message of forgiveness and reconciliation to a land that was already so broken by hatred and war. And one night while she was preaching at a church in Munich, her message was on forgiveness. And she told the people, she said, when we confess our sins, God casts them into the deepest part of the sea, gone forever. The room was crowded when she concluded her message and many of the people gathered began to file out the back door, but there was one man who she saw starting to make her way forward against the crowd. And as he got closer, she noticed that his face was the same soldier that had so viciously attacked them in Ravensbrook. She could see as the room kind of transformed back into the camp, she could see the pathetic pile of clothing that was all piled up at the center of the room, the shoes at the center of the floor as they lined up for their inspection. And she again felt this overwhelming shame of walking naked past this very man as he laughed and hurled insults at her and her sister now dead. This man, the snake, was standing right in front of her. And he thrust out his hand to her and he said, a fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. Corey talks about the lump in her throat and the heat of anger rising in her chest and into her face as this man offered her his hand and she could just look at it like it was a disgusting thing. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he said. He said, I was a guard there. But since that time I have become a Christian, I know that God has forgiven me for all the cruel things that I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. Will you forgive me? Corey tells how the moment seemed to last for an eternity. She said that she stood there with a cold bitterness clutching her heart and she cried out to God, Jesus, help me. I can't, I can't forgive this man, but I can lift my hand. I can do that much if you supply the feeling. I don't know about you, but stories like that one just make me uncomfortable because I can't imagine anything worse than seeing my loved ones hurt and humiliated by an evil person and me just being completely powerless to stop it. Can you? I can't think of anything worse than that. But I can think of a lot of ways I'd like to deal with those kinds of people. That's not a problem for me, right? And forgiveness usually isn't at the top of that list. Because when someone does something like that and hurts the ones that I love that much, I want justice, not mercy. I want retribution, right? Not forgiveness. And it doesn't matter how they feel about it either, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter if they're sorry or not. Psalm 51 is a psalm that is written by a snake. A man who committed a grotesque and deplorable sin, very much like the Nazi soldier who humiliated and struck down Betsy Ten Boom. 
a snake that writes Psalm 51 out of a broken heart for what he has done. But we need to ask ourselves this morning, do we really care what he has to say about it? Do we really care if he feels bad about what he did? Because, you know, the deed is done, right? There's nothing he can say that can change what happened. What do we really want for snakes like this? Do we want mercy? Or do we want justice? Psalm Psalm. Psalm 51 is one of the few psalms that tells us exactly what it relates to and why it was written. Just before verse 1, the chapter heading states, To the choir master, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Now, most of you probably know this story, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, I'm just going to read a brief passage for you, and then I'll paraphrase some of the rest. But if you want to follow along, the story begins in 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to do battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel... And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And so David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now, it doesn't take much imagination to get the gist of what's happened here. David is the king of a united Israel. It was late in the day, and he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was supposed to be out on the battlefield with his men, leading the charge. That's what kings did, but he wasn't. But for whatever reason, you know, David decided to hang back in Jerusalem, and it was late in the day, a warm, sunny evening, warm enough for someone to take a bath outside. And David is at home laying on his couch. You can almost imagine the evening sun coming in through the curtains, awakening him from a long afternoon nap. When he decides to take a stroll up on the roof of his house, maybe get some fresh air, and overlook all that the Lord has blessed him with. After all, he was the man, right? He was God's chosen king. And that's when he sees it. Something that doesn't belong to him. Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah. And you know what struck me about this story this time I read it? Eliam. I mean, Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam. I've never noticed that before. Because you see... Bathsheba wasn't only the wife of Uriah. She was someone's daughter, right? She was someone's baby girl. And King David just took her, right? The king just decided that he liked what he saw and he took her. Didn't matter that she had a husband. Didn't matter that she had a family. Didn't matter that she had a mother and a father who who loved her and cared for her. What a snake, right? What a snake. When I saw that, I became enraged at David. Because when I think about my own children, my own daughters, and how I would feel if someone ever did that to them, right? What David did to Bathsheba, are we not just enraged? Because if you know the rest of the story, you know that Bathsheba became pregnant by David and then in, in like an attempt to hide this sin, 
he sent for her husband to come home from the battle, right? That, that, that David himself should have been fighting in. And he invites Uriah into his house and he gets him drunk and he sends him home for the night, hoping that if he goes home when he's drunk, maybe something will happen and Uriah will believe that the child in Bathsheba's belly is his own. And all of this can just go away, right? No one will ever know. But Uriah, being a good man of honor, he doesn't go home. Instead, he sleeps in the king's doorway saying, how can I go home and sleep warm in my bed while my fellow Israelites shiver in the open fields of battle? Uriah was a good man. And but when... When David learns that Uriah didn't go home and that his plan to cover up his sin wasn't going to work, instead of confessing his sin and begging for forgiveness deeper into the pit of sin, he goes. He sends a message to Joab, the military leader, informing him that he's going to send Uriah back to the front line of battle. And he tells Joab, when he gets there, make sure he doesn't come home. What a snake. So do we even care what he has to say in Psalm 51? Does it really matter if he feels bad or not? On November the 10th of 2015, an 18-year-old boy named Larry Taylor and a 21-year-old boy named Jalen Watson broke into the home of Davy and Amanda Blackburn on the north side of Indianapolis in the town where we all live, right? Davy was the lead pastor of a Resonate Church. He and Amanda had a 15-month-old son named, I mean, Weston, and Amanda was 12 weeks pregnant with their second child. Davy was working out at a local gym that morning when Larry and Jalen broke into their home and they found Amanda and, um, you know, Weston alone. And after burglarizing the home and taking everything they could from Amanda, they killed her leaving Davy without his wife and Weston without his mother. Do we even care if they feel bad? The deed is done. The sin is committed. Does it really matter how they feel now? Because if I'm Eliam, you know, Bathsheba's dad, I could think of a few may. I can think of a few ways I might want to deal with good old King David. And if I'm Davy Blackburn, I can think of a few ways I'd like to deal with Larry Taylor and Jalen Watson. You understand what I'm saying? Psalm 51 was written by King David, but if it were written by Larry Taylor or Jalen Watson, would we still want to read it? Would it change anything? Would we listen to their pleas for forgiveness or have compassion on them because they acknowledge their sin? Or would we say, oh no, not you. Not you. Your sin is too great. Your sin is too evil. Nothing you can do or say can make right what you've done. And for God to just forgive such things like this is scandalous, right? I mean, evil crimes have been committed and justice must be served. Atonement must be made, right? Do we even care how bad they feel about their sin? Because guess what? God does. God cares about how they feel about their sin. And he cares about how you and I feel about our sin. And that's, that that's where so many of us find ourselves this morning. 
every Sunday morning should bring us face to face with the scandal of the cross. The preposterous notion that if we confess our sin and repent, that God actually forgives sins, even as wicked as these, by holding His own Son accountable. Because it's only when we recognize the scandal of what occurred on the cross and how our sins were atoned for there, do we truly recognize what our sins cost God. Psalm 51 is a psalm for sinners in that it teaches us how to think and feel about our sin, how to be broken by our sin, and how God will forgive us if we're willing to turn and be forgiven. Amen? Because when David comes face to face with his sin, he cries out from the depths of his soul. He cries, have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Blot out what I have done. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. I know what I've done, and my sin is ever before me. David recognizes the gravity of his sin, and he begs God for mercy and forgiveness. And you know what? I've been there. I've been there, haven't you? I mean, there have been so many days that I fall short, that I sin against God, and I don't even know what to do besides throw my hands in the air and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's all I can do. And if you're here this morning and you're broken by the weight of your sin, if you feel that, then we've got to know that there is hope. There is a way back. And it doesn't matter what you've done. Whether you're a drunkard or a racist, an adulterer or a pedophile, you might be a gossip and a cheat addicted to pornography, addicted to drugs, it doesn't matter. God cares how you feel about your sin, and He will forgive you if you ask Him. Just listen to what David says. He says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a new heart, O God, and renew within me a right spirit. Is there anyone here this morning who longs to be clean? Who longs for a new heart and a right spirit because they're available if you ask. And the best part is you don't have to atone for your sin. I don't have to atone for my sins. I don't have to make it right because Christ has already done that for us. When He died on the cross, God loves us that much. Verses 16 through 17 says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. There's nothing we can give up. There's no sacrifice we can offer to make this right. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Because the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. And a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. How do you feel about your sin this morning? Anyone broken? Because forgiveness is possible. Forgiveness is the supernatural power of God that restores our lives, that pardons us from our sins, and is available if we ask. 
In 1947, a Nazi soldier reached for the hand of Corey Ten Boom, asking for her forgiveness. Corey was overcome with hate and disdain for this man who had brought her and her family so much pain. She stood there with a cold bitterness clutching her heart and cried out to God, Jesus, help me. I can't forgive this man, but I can lift my hand. I can do that much if you supply the feeling. And in that moment, what Corey herself could not do, God did for her. She lifted her hand, and as she did, an incredible thing took place. She says an electrical current started in her shoulder, raced down her arm, and sprang into their joined hands. And a healing warmth flooded her whole body, bringing tears to her eyes and forced her to cry out, I forgive you, brother, with my whole heart. Friends, it's true. When we confess our sins, God takes our sins and he casts them into the deepest part of the sea. Gone forever. You see, we don't have to suffer judgment. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if we, that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So this morning, wherever you are, would you just bow your head with me right now and let me pray for you? I don't know what sins we have harboring in our lives right now, but God does and you do too. And so I'm going to ask you to give that to God this morning so we can go forward. Because we can't go forward if we will not confess. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to stand here this morning, Lord, and to be a mouthpiece, Lord, to call sinners to repentance, Lord, as we all are. Father, I pray that we would confess to you and to each other, Lord, so that we can go forward in this community, so that we can be a light, Lord, that shines for you. Lord, we are not better than anyone. We all have issues. We all have darkness, Lord, in our souls that need illumined. So, Father, I pray for each and every one here this morning. I pray, Lord, if there's, if there's one heart that is far from you, that is clutching on to a sin that they feel they cannot be forgiven of, Father, that you would weasel it out of them. Lord, right now, that your healing warmth of forgiveness would just flood their bodies, Lord. And in Jesus' name, I pray this, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would just be thick in the room, thick in our hearts, Lord, as we long to live for you, this new life, Lord, so, so break our hearts. Give us a contrite spirit, Lord, as we come face to face with what you've done for us on the cross. Lord, help us to nail that sin right there as you have taken that from us. All these things we ask in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen.